Good morning and welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals. This is the appeal of Pool OTA case number 21129326. Uh, my name is Andrew Wong. I'm the lead administrative law judge or ALJ who will be conducting the oral hearing for this case. Uh, on today's panel, as you just heard, is uh, in addition to myself, we have judges Josh Aldrich and Mike Lee. Um, since the roll call has already been called, I won't go over again who's um, appearing, but I will ask you to identify yourselves for the record once we go on the record uh, in a few minutes. This hearing is being conducted electronically. All participants, including the ALJs, are video conferencing into this hearing. Should you have any problems with video conferencing during the hearing, please rejoin as soon as possible. If you are unable to rejoin the video conference, I believe we've provided you a backup phone number or we will provide you a backup phone number for you to call in. This video conference is being uh, live streamed to the public and a video recording will be made available on OTA's YouTube channel. Also, uh, our stenographer, Ms. Lynn Alonzo, will report this hearing verbatim and prepare an official hearing transcript, which will be made available on OTA's website. To help Ms. Alonzo make a clear record, I have four requests. Number one, please state your name every time before you speak. Uh, that's just because we're doing this by video. Sometimes it's hard to identify who's speaking, especially if everyone is appearing in a grid pattern like I have you appearing right now. Number two, please speak slowly, clearly, and directly into your microphone or communication device. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Number three, please do not speak over each other or interrupt when someone else is speaking. Also self-explanatory. And number four, please answer vo verbally and with words. Do not nod or shake your head or say uh-huh or uh-uh because that doesn't really appear clearly on the transcript. If Ms. Alonzo cannot hear, understand, or identify someone who is speaking, she has permission to interrupt the oral hearing at any time to get clarification. Uh, speaking of clarification, I would like to clarify that this oral hearing is before the Office of Tax Appeals, OTA, which is a separate agency from the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or CDTFA. OTA is not a court, but is an, but is an independent appeals body. The office is staffed by tax experts and is independent of the state's taxing agencies. As I noted earlier, I'm the lead ALJ for purposes of conducting this oral hearing. However, my co-panelists and I are co-equal decision makers and may ask questions of either party during the hearing. Further, our panel of three ALJs will, deci will decide all the issues presented to us and each of us will have an equal vote in making those decisions. All right, let's uh, get through a few preliminaries. I just wanted to confirm the issue. We have one issue today, and that is whether appellants storage, use, or other consumption of a vessel in California is subject to tax. Mr. Mesa, is that a correct, uh, is that your understanding of what the issue is? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. That's our understanding of the issue. Thank you. And CDTFA, is that a correct uh, understanding of the issue? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will now verify uh, exhibits. Appellant has proposed exhibits one through five. Um, Ms. Daniels, does CDTFA have any objections to those proposed exhibits? Uh, we do not. Okay. And Mr. Mesa, you had no other uh, documents or exhibits to submit, is that correct? Uh, not at this moment, no, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, and then CDTFA, you propose exhibits A through B. Uh, Mr. Mesa, did you have any objections to those proposed exhibits from CDTFA? No, Your Honor. Thank you. And Ms. Daniels, you had no other uh, documents or exhibits to submit, is that correct? No, we do not, thank you. Okay. And Mr. Mesa, you have uh, one witness, Mr. Brett Poole, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, and CDTFA has no witnesses. Um, all right, uh, just a time allocation. Um, it was anticipated that the oral hearing would take approximately 65 minutes as follows. Uh, I about 30 minutes, the appellant has requested 30 minutes for its presentation, uh, witness testimony, as well as its closing remarks. And CDTFA has requested 20 minutes. And I've budgeted about 15 minutes for these preliminaries and introductions and uh, ALJ questions. So we're looking at about 65 minutes. Uh, Mr. Mesa, how did you wanna divide your 30 minutes um, between your main presentation and your closing? Uh, five, uh, ideally I had requested 30 minutes, but I don't anticipate it's going to take 30 minutes, your honor. So I'm thinking, uh, roughly 3 to 5 minutes in my opening presentation, uh, another 5 to 10, uh, for Mr. Poole to ask, uh, answer some questions. And then, uh, just the 2 to 3 minutes to close. Okay, that's fine. Um, I think we're the only, uh, hearing this morning. So, um, uh, we have a little bit of room, but okay. Thank you very much.
Um, all right, Mr. Mesa, any final questions before we go on the record? I uh, know, Your Honor. Okay, CDTFA, any final questions? No, Your Honor. Okay, uh, Judge Aldrich, uh, Judge Lee, are you guys uh, ready to go? Ready. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Alonzo. Are you ready to go on the record? All right. Thumbs up from Ms. Alonzo. All right. Let's go on the record. We are opening the record in the appeal of pool before the Office of Tax Appeals. This is OTA case number two one one two nine three two six. Today is Thursday, January twenty sixth, two thousand twenty three. The time is the time is nine thirty one a.m. We are holding this hearing by video conference. I am Lead Administrative Law Judge Andrew Wong, and with me today are Judges Josh Aldrich and Mike Lee. We are the panel hearing and deciding this case. Uh, the individuals representing the appellant taxpayer, please identify yourselves. Carlos Mesa for appellant Brett Poole, Your Honor. Brett Poole. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Uh, individuals representing uh, the Respondent Tax Agency, California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, CDTFA. Please identify yourselves. Courtney Daniels for the department. Chad Backus also with the department. And Jason Parker with CDTFA. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. We are considering one issue today, whether appellant storage use or other consumption of a vessel in California is subject to tax. Mr. Mesa, is that a correct statement of the issue? That is correct, Your Honor. Ms. Daniels, is that a correct statement of the issue? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Appellant has identified and submitted proposed exhibits one through five as evidence and has no other exhibits to offer as evidence. Uh, CDTFA has no objections to them. Is that correct, Ms. Daniels? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Therefore, appellant's exhibits one through five will be admitted into the record as evidence. CDTFA has identified and submitted proposed exhibits A through B as evidence and has no other uh, documents to offer in as evidence. Mr. Mesa, uh, you have no objections to those proposed exhibits. Is that correct? That is correct. No objections. This is wrong. Thank you. CDTFA's exhibits A and B will be admitted into the record as evidence. Uh, Mr. Mesa uh, has one witness, Mr. Brett Poole, and CDTFA has no witnesses. All right. Uh, I will now swear in the record, and then after that, uh, Mr. Mesa and Mr. Poole, you can uh, proceed with your <coughs> presentation. Mr. Poole, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear and affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Uh, all right, Mr. Mesa, you may proceed. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, Mr. Poole has been a longtime sailor, and the issue arises from his uh, love for sailing. Uh, in 2014, Mr. Poole uh, purchased the sailing vessel, the Dublin Dragon, in Oregon. And at that time, he understood, I mean, they had quite a bit of repairs to do on the Dublin Dragon. And he ex he uh, had expectations for that vessel to be sold down to the farthest point of Baja California, down in Los Cabos. And lo and behold, when he started working on the vessel, he realized there was more <laughs> than what he a little bit bargained for in the repair department. So that delayed his initial voyage. He had anticipated for sailing out during the summertime as a vacation for himself uh, over a three month voyage, including some time in Mexico. The goal of that trip was not just for vacation purposes, but was also to moor that ship in Mexico. Uh, Mr. Poole did have a boat at that time in California, but he didn't want to, he couldn't possibly moor another boat at that slip in Orange County. So he, for financial reasons and for practicality purposes, he knew he just wanted to sell it down to Mexico and keep it down there for future use for later vacations. Uh, unfortunately, the delays in the trip caused him to set sail uh, near, in October near the fall when weather conditions can be a little risky. He tried to get it out before the winter and unfortunately to his bad luck, he ran into a severe storm that forced him and his crew to seek refuge because the boat had been extensively damaged out at sea. After that, it was just a serious onslaught of displays between repairs and then him not being able to hire a crew immediately, trying to find people who would sail with him, 
and bouncing between that and between work, it was it was a bit of a hectic uh, voyage to complete. So it was a constant fight for him to get that boat down there, and he, he had to use his witty and his and his uh, and his expertise and knowledge in sailing to get it down as uh, safe as possible. But yes, there was some damage that was very extensive that he had to repair along the way, being an older boat. And had it not been for that storm and that damage, he would have been able to one shot uh, the trip all the way down to Baja without stopping with his crew. Without the crew, he could not sail alone for a little longer for long periods of time. So that forced him to constantly be able to having to stop. Uh, I have nothing more to say at this moment, Your Honor. This Judge Schwab, thank you. Would you like to uh, commence with your witness, uh, yes. witness examination? Yes, please proceed. Mr. Poole, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Brett. Uh, I'd like to start off by asking a couple of questions. Uh, how would, how long have you say, would you say you've been sailing for? Uh, I've been sailing uh, since 1984. 1984. Um, how did you start your sailing uh, practice or what is your history? We'd like to elaborate a little more on that. Oh, um, in 1984, I started uh, windsurfing. Uh, 1986, I purchased an 18-foot catamaran, which I sailed for years off of um, Newport Beach and Dana Point. Um, in 1997, I met a friend who had a 42-foot sloop. Um, in Long Beach, and um, I sailed with him extensively through the Channel Islands and primarily Cat, um, Catalina Island. Um, I sailed with uh, Judd to Cabo San Lucas in the fall of 2000, and five years later, I sailed um, from Long Beach to Hawaii with um, with Judd. In um, January of 2013, I purchased a very heavily used uh, Newport it's called a Newport 41. It's a sloop. Um, I bought it primarily because there was a, a mooring that finally came available in Newport Beach. So I bought the two together. And um, my intention with that boat, because that was a very light sort of racing boat, was just to do some amateur racing with that. Um, so I had that boat. And then in January 14, I purchased the Dublin Dragon in Portland. Um, and with the intent that that would eventually be the boat that I would use to do some um, open ocean sailing because a new a uh, Dublin Dragon is a 37 foot Tiana, which is a world renowned um, open blue water, heavy, heavy cruiser boat, um, primarily made for circumventing the planet. So that's okay. my history. So it's, it's extensive in the sailing world. Um, and that doesn't include, you know, my time as a, U.S. Coast Guard captain. Okay, and you, would you say that uh, mooring docks and slips are are limited and scarce at times? Oh, say repeat that, please, Mister Mister Poole. Would you say that mooring uh, sluits uh, for for mooring your ships uh, are they limited in quantity or scarce at times? Hard to come by sometimes. Oh, like this, um, Tiana. Uh, well, when you uh, locations to moor it to dock. Oh it. yes, yeah, they're um. In fact, if if it hadn't been for some actions by um, the Harbor Commission, where they had tripled the um, fees for moorings, um, I don't think there had been a mooring sold in Newport Beach for 20 years. Um, there was a lot of back and forth. They had tripled or quadrupled the um, costs for moorings and the fees. So this mooring with the Newport 41 on it, I had a chance to buy that, and because. I knew that shortly after that, um, they would Newport Beach would have to bring its mooring rates back in line with the rest of the state. So it was a very narrow window of opportunity that I had. So there's, you know, the mooring eventually became quite expensive, but um, there were no other moorings available that for purchase because they could only buy, I think, two at the time and there weren't any others. And without a mooring, um, it would be impossible for me to moor a boat in Newport Beach just because of the cost. Um, it, it'd be a, somewhere between five and six thousand a month, possibly for a forty-five foot mooring for the Dragon. So I had no, I had no other options. Um, 
as far. So there was never any intent to, to keep it in Newport, we just move on past. Correct. Right. Okay. And when you purchased the Dublin Dragon, uh, what was your original int uh, sailing intent for that boat? Well, the original sailing intent was to, you know, keep it in Portland for as long as necessary to complete um, the repairs and the upgrades to get it ready again for open ocean. And then I, the intent was to sail it down to Cabo or um, San Jose del Cabo, um, where I was going to um, keep it with a lot of other Americans down there on their boats. Um, it's a safe harbor. It's obviously a great place for vacation, but... Um, that was the intent to bring the dragon down there. Okay. And how far off were you delayed in your original trip plans? And uh, it, well, you know, the idea was to leave in about July, but I ended up having to replace uh integral part of the boat, which are called the chain plates. They hold the rigging on. They're essential to safe operation. That that set me back a couple months because they had to be manufactured and I had to replace the beds on the boat. It's not an atypical um, repair for a boat of that age. I just, when the boat was surveyed, the surveyor did not catch that. So um, that put me deep into, um, into the fall and all the sailing guides from the sailing the Pacific Northwest are like, as long as you're heading south on, um, October 1st, you're okay, but don't do it any later. So I managed to get repairs done, and I thought, well, I can make the October 1st um, departure date, and that's how that came about. Okay. Now, the unfortunate incident that caused damage to your boat was off Bodega Bay, correct? Yeah, it was um, northwest of Bodega Bay, probably um, 40 to 50 uh, nautical miles. Um, that was on October 7th. Uh, late afternoon, um, and it's one of the things they warn you about. And in that part of the shore up there, there's no really safe harbor. So, but what happened is um, a gale force, uh, a gale came in, which is one level below a hurricane. And for, um, you know, four out of seven hours of this gale, it was, you know, pardon the language, it was closer to hell at times. I had the mast in the water several times. Um, the boat was being rolled from side to side through 180 degrees. And I've got myself, my dog, and it it was it was a dangerous situation. It's not that the boat isn't made to do that. But I mean, at one point I was thrown through the galley and I actually broke the galley table off. I've got my dog in the in the galley of the boat rolling back and forth stuff is coming out of the i mean the boat's literally healing through 180 degrees with the mass hitting the water i've got 15 to 20 foot water and you know by the time i've done this for for four hours um i'm i've got all the repairs that were done on the boat i've, I've got to seek safe harbor because i didn't know all I know is that I'm in a gale. I'm trying to follow the weather through the U.S. Coast Guard, and I don't know how long it's going to last. So I made plans to um, enter Bodega Harbor just to seek safe harbor because I also didn't know if the gale was going to increase in force or go down. It just it was a very dangerous situation, and it had to be dealt with. So um, with no intention whatsoever of... Um, entering you know any harbor or port in california i had to do so just for the safe for my safety for my and my crew's safety and and at this point you know things had begin to started to fall apart on the boat primarily you know sails were beginning to tear the jib sheets which control the the foresail which is the one you would use in a in a backwind situation one of those began to tear and you know i I may have been able to repair it out at sea, but I've got 15 foot waters with the boat rolling. I, it would have been just a very dangerous situation. And my crew member, David, didn't have the sailing experience to be able to handle that boat alone if I was to go overboard. So, um, you know, just safety dictated that I had to, had to seek shelter. Okay. Uh, Mr. Poole, we refer to exhibit three. There is a log, a captain's log. Mm -hmm. Is this something you prepared and you don't routinely keep? And what kind of uh, information do you input into that log? Um, 
normally what is, you know, the day, the time, um, your position, the weather is often included um, on a longer, you know, sales like, you know, we had been out at sea for several days. You might not, you know, enter every single day, but you would enter details if anything significant happened. Um, one of the things that was obvious on October 7 is even in the morning when I got up, there's um, something that most sailors that with experience on the West Coast are going to understand. If you get up and your decks are dry, there's something going on. And I, I knew by noon something was going to happen. Um, so I'd already begin to prepare for potentially bad weather. And that's when the U.S. Coast Guard began to announce, you know, the possibility of a gale. But so I'd already prepared the boat. But at this point, I'm, you know, 60, 70 miles uh, northwest of Bodega. There, there is absolutely no other harbors to go into. So uh, to be prudent, what you would do is head offshore further we went from probably 12 miles off to 20 miles off just to give you some safe room between the rocks of the shore and um the gale did happen and so we fought that for several hours and um the thing was to sit out at sea and ride it out or um try to seek safe harbor but um you know those were my two decisions so what i did though for primarily for my safety and for David, I decided to seek shelter as opposed to stay offshore. Okay. Mr. Poole, when you said so, you left with a crew of how many? Uh, one, David Erickson and um, and a dog. Dog, okay. Uh, for after the Bodega Bay incident, did you sail with a crew or were you sailing solo? Um, at that point, when I took it, after I had the boat in Bottega and made the repairs, I sailed it solo to um, Monterey, which was about 28 hours. And um, so I, I'm up for, you know, I'm, I'm too close near shore to sleep. So at, at 24 hours, I'm just like, I got to seek shelter. So I called Monterey and I got a transient slip in Monterey. And um, that that forced the... Um, that stop. Do you want me to continue after that on or? Yes, please. Oh, um, from Monterey. Um, so the boat, I had to return back to work. I managed to get a couple other friends to do the next leg. Um, we went, but they didn't have more than just the long weekend. So with, um, a couple other crew members, I sailed from, um, Monterey to um, Morro, Morro Bay, and kept the boat there. I think um, once in Morro Bay, we returned to Orange County, and um, just because of the timing and some weather issues, I wasn't able to return for like I. My dates might be off, and I might I wasn't able to return to Morro Bay for I think two weeks, and then I sailed it um, with a couple crew members around. Um, around to Santa Barbara. And again, because now we're deep into wet winter, um, the days are really short. It's very cold. Um, at this point, I had given up any hope of um, sailing directly to Mexico just because we're, now I'm in the winter. So my next stop was, um, um, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, right around the corner. Um, I can't even think of the name right now. Um, wherever the uh, God, the university of um anyway right sorry about that let me it, it wasn't ventura it was the harbor prior to ventura anyway so from there you know the boat sat for a week i went up with um i sailed there solo um i think it was early december from from there to um san pedro that was solo. That was another 28 hours on the water. And at this point, it's almost Christmas time. Um, and the boat sat in San Pedro for a, a week or two until I was able to get a friend of mine, Eric Mai, where we, we went from San Pedro to um, Ensenada in one shot. And that was um, right around Christmas or New Year's. I forget the exact dates. Okay. 
Mr. Poole, would you say one shot solo uh, a solo sailing is a dangerous task uh, that is particularly almost hard to do during the winter? Well, yeah, you know, there, there's various opinions on that. Some people will say never do it. Um, a lot of people do it all the time, but they do it out in open water, not anywhere near shore because or anywhere near um, shipping lanes. Um, that would happen like going to the South Pacific, for instance, um, around the coast of California with the amount of fishing and the amount of freighters. Um, it's not it's nothing you can do safely. And you need to be a lot further offshore than 20 miles because you can cover 20 miles fairly quickly. And if you were to fall asleep, you could find yourself on the rocks, which is um, the world is full of those stories. So um, none of the sailing I did on the way down would have been prudent to sleep at all. So I was um, so on the sections that I did solo, I had to stay awake. And okay. at some point that becomes not safe in itself just because of exhaustion okay absent the bodega bay incident would you have been able to sell straight down to mexico oh absolutely yeah that was we were we had um you know 140 gallons of water we had almost um 100 gallons of diesel um we were completely ready to go i mean the boat was blue water capable um that was had it not been for Bodega, there would have been no stop in California whatsoever. My crew at that time, because it was right after October, they were prepared for, um, you know, seven days at a minimum up to 10 days to get to Ensenada, which is typical of a boat that size to go Portland to um, Ensenada. Okay. And you mentioned Ensenada. So the original plan was to go to Los Cabos, but then you shifted to Ensenada at what point in time? Well, that was Ensenada probably would have been a stop along the way anyway, just because um, that's about a 900 mile trip. And then from uh, maybe about a thousand and from Ensenada to Cabo is about 800 miles. That's a, that I wasn't set up for that. So Ensenada was always going to be a stop to re um, to refit the boat and to um, you know, make any repairs that are necessary, but to um, outfit, you know, add food, add water, add diesel um, for the for the trip to Cabo. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Poole. Okay. I'd like to proceed just by stating that uh, what Mr. Poole, uh, as you can tell from his testimony, is that had it not been for that incident, he would have been able to sell nonstop to, to Mexico with his crew. Without the crew, he'd be sailing solo in dangerous conditions that wouldn't be prudent and would just be, uh, I would say, inconsiderate and reckless to other sailors and other boats out at sea, especially if you're going down commercial lanes. And I mean, for the safety in general, public welfare of others, he did the prudent thing by stopping. But had it not been for that storm, he should have been able to go nonstop. Uh, as you can see from the exhibits uh, that I provided earlier, there there's a log detailing his entire journey uh, including repairs. There's receipts as well showing the extensive amount of repairs that he had to do. There's even a weather report showing that of, of what the storm when it hit. Now, hearing that story is the kind of chill, <laughs> it brings chills, you know, because I mean, I love my dogs <laughs> and and being out at sea with another another person too. And you're, you're playing with more than one person's life, not just your life at that point in time. So, Mr. Poole did the prudent thing in pulling into Bodega Bay and having a ship repaired instead of risking the lives of his crew. Uh, it would be unconscionable and unjust for Mr. Poole to be charged usage tax by the state of California for an incident that arose from, a, from necessity from an emergency. It was never his intention to, to moor the boat in California. It was impossible for him to do so. He already had a ship in California, and Mr. Poole made it out clear that uh, availability for these slips uh, to moor your boats is something that's uh, rare, or I wouldn't say rare, but scarce. The scarcity of it made it for made it, uh, unforce, uh, unseeable in the future, in the near future, at the very least. For I mean, at the very least, for at least twelve months, for him to even moor the Dublin Dragon 
in California. That is why he decided he would take it to Mexico. It was always intent to go to Mexico. Had it not been for the storm, he would have been able to go all, gone all the way down to Cabo. But the delays and and the, the unforeseen events caused him to end up in Ensenada at the end point. Uh, at this time, I'd like you to reconsider all the facts of the case and understand that Mr. Poole is just a victim of an emergency and had to more in California for necessity, but never for intent to keep the boat permanently in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maitza. Thank you, Mr. Poole. I will now turn to CDTFA and offer them the opportunity to cross-examine uh, Mr. Poole. I think I just have one question for clarification purposes. Um, you just testified that it was always a plan to stop off in Ensenada before heading down to Cabo. So I just wanted to clarify that Ensen well, first of all, I'm assuming we're speaking about Ensenada, California, or are we speaking about some place in Mexico? Um, in Mexico, Ensenada, Mexico. Mexico. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Daniels. Um, all right, I will now turn to my panel to see if they have uh, for the witness or Mr. Mesa, starting with Judge Lee. Uh, this is Judge Lee. I have a few questions. Um, when were the entries in the captain's log prepared? What's that? When when was the entries in the captain's log prepared? Oh, they're um, they're taken every day as you go. And um, they're written down on whatever, typically you have a log in the boat. In this case, I was keeping a lot of the log on an iPad. Okay, thank you. And um, and, and sorry if I'm having trouble a little bit reading your handwriting here. Does the captain's log discuss the storm that you mentioned? Um, it should have, yeah, somewhere in that log. It's definitely, it was noted because I've I've took um, screen captures of of NOAA's um, weather report and of you know the the overall graphic of that storm, including the date and time. That should be in one of the exhibits. It, okay, if 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 there's a particular point or line that you can point to, that that would be helpful for me. Um, I don't. Um, if you go to. I can I can I can answer that, Your Honor. If you go to what would be October eighth, that's when the incident around the time the incident started. Uh, it would be page one, two, three, four, five. Page five of the log in the exhibit of exhibit uh three. Okay. Thank you, and, and I see the October 8th um, date. Which which particular line are you referring to? Uh, it would start, uh, uh, if you go down to middle of the right, of left hand side, it starts to describe some of the repair, uh, the damage table broken. I believe it was, we were uh, 540 degrees instantly uh, entering Bodega Bay. Uh, we were, were disappearing, 20 foot waves. It, there's descriptions is basically he's jotting down the the, the description of very, very shorthand of what's going on. Okay, thank you. No further questions from me. This is Judge Wong. Uh, Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions for the witness or Mr. Maitza? Uh, hi, this is Judge Aldrich. I have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, you purchased the boat. And then uh, when was it first registered? Um, well, the boat was registered when I bought it to the previous owner in Oregon. I changed that registration to my name in Oregon, which is um, in Oregon. That registration is good for two years. Okay. So, and then what um, I proceeded immediately to do is um, Oregon requires state registration. The state of California does not. And I registered the the boat federally with the U.S. Coast Guard. So I have a U.S. Coast Guard number for the vessel. It's never been registered in California. It's not necessary. Okay. And then um, at some point, was it registered in Mexico? 
Uh, no, it, I have paperwork in from Ensenada when I entered the country of and then um, cleared customs and vehicle, all the vessel um, legalities that are necessary. All I've got the paperwork for all of that when I cleared into Mexico. Okay, and I just kind of wanted to get the timeline down. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as far as the 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 stops in California, okay. um, so Bodega Bay, when do you leave? Um, here let me. So depart Portland on thirty September. Um, Bodega, I entered Bodega Harbor on um, October eighth. Shortly after midnight, I departed Bodega Harbor on um, November fifteenth. November fifteenth. Yeah. On, okay. Then I sailed for twenty four hours, um, entering Monterey. On I departed Monterey on the twenty. So, hold up. Oh. Uh, so you arrive in Monterey on the sixteenth. Yes. Okay. And then uh, you depart Monterey when? On the 29th of November. Okay. And uh, you proceed to Morro Bay, is that correct? Yeah. So and I entered Morro on November 30. So that was about a 24 hour trip as well? Yes. Okay. Um, and then from Morro Bay, uh, you go to Santa Barbara? Santa Barbara, yeah. Um, okay. And, and how long was that trip? I departed Morro Bay um, on December 6th. And again, it's another um, 24, 28 hour trip. I entered Santa Barbara on um, December 7. Okay. And um, from you from Santa Barbara, you go to San Pedro? Um, yes, uh, yeah. Um, departing Santa Barbara on the 13th of December, I entered um, San Pedro on the 14th of December. Okay, and then uh, after San Pedro? On January 1, I left with Eric Mai from San Pedro and headed to Ensenada. Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, that's all the questions that I had at the moment. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it back to uh, Judge um, Judge Wong. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. Um, I also had a few questions for Mr. Poole. Um, so I just wanted to, again, go over the timeline a little bit. Um, so you purchased the Dublin Dragon in Oregon on January 14th, 2014, right? Right. Sure. January. Yeah, that was, um, I had started the purchase on, um, in December of 2013, it was completed and all the, the paperwork and, you know, the legalities were completed in, um, um, January of 2014. You're right. This is Judge Wong, and I believe you had testified that you had intended to keep it in Oregon for a period of time. Is that correct? Yeah, I needed, um, I needed the boat had been in Oregon for quite a few years on the Columbia and it wasn't ready for open ocean water sailing, which is far more rigorous. Um, so my intent was to keep it there as long as necessary to make it safe to um, go south. I was hoping that I would be ready to go south in the summer sometime in June or July. Um, but if I wasn't able to complete the repairs, I was going to leave it in Oregon for that winter. Um, it, so that what happened is I was able to complete the repairs before the sort of magical October um, one deadline for heading south for transiting south in a boat. This is Judge Wong, did you? Um, I noticed you made arrangements for your boat um, in Oregon. There, were, there was documents indicating you had. I guess rented a slip in Oregon. Is that yeah? Yeah on it, on October um on 
1st of October, I entered the, it's called a tenancy agreement with the marina to, um, to rent a slip for a month on a month to month basis to keep the boat there as long as um, possible. Okay. So it was on a month to month basis. Yeah. Um, did you make any arrangements for the boat ahead of time in Cabo or Ensenada at the, at the time you purchased the boat in January? No, I, it, it's not, um, uh, necessary. I had been in contact with people in, um, San Jose, but I'd also been in contact with the Marina in Ensenada and they had plenty of availability. They said, just let us know when you're coming down or when you think you're going to make it. There was, there was no contract made with any of them. It just wasn't necessary. Okay. So there's no documentary evidence showing a contract for a long-term rental of a slip in either Ensenada or Cabo. Uh, no, because even in in um, in Cabo, I hadn't decided which of the marinas to stay at, and they all had availability along with there's some excellent anchorages. So, so there also no like, you didn't uh, request any quotes for saying like, oh, I'm going to be in Cabo for X amount of months or years, or anything like that. Yeah, no, I did did request um, those by email. I don't think I saved any. They just said, here's what your monthly fee will be. Um, here's some other incidentals such as, you know, necessary insurance. Um, and they gave me a number, but there, there were no, um, there were no formal quotes. It's, it's very much Mexico that way. And. Okay. Um, let me just see if I have any other questions. Oh, okay. Um, this is my last question, I believe. Um, and then I believe Judge Aldrich has another question for you. Uh, in the briefs, um, you had argued that you intended to keep the vessel moored in Mexico um, after your three month summer vacation there based on a financial analysis that it would be cheaper. Um, and so, do you have any documentary evidence of this financial analysis, spreadsheets? Again, quotes, contracts, things like that. No, it's it's just that um, at that point, I was looking at um, a couple of the the slips if they were available in Southern California. Um, um, virtually nothing was available. Most people start either in Wilmington or in the um, Long Beach Harbor, that's closest to the uh, commercial harbor. Um, they, I was running in the six to $700 range there, uh, Newport beach. If I could have found a private slip probably would have been in the $3,500 a month range. So it made, um, anything in, um, Newport beach economically. I mean, I couldn't afford that. Um, and it's very, very difficult to get slips on, um, sort of an immediate basis like that. In fact, if I probably went to the downtown harbor in Long Beach right now, I'm going to guess I'd be sitting at three to four months before I could even get in. So they keep a fair amount of transient slips. But for instance, in um, in Santa Barbara, you can only stay in the harbor for two weeks. The, the, your rates will triple after that. And that's so that they don't get people like sort of permanently sitting on a transient slip. Slips are very difficult to get except for a few available transient slips, which all the harbors maintain. This is well. But it also sounds like you considered after you purchased the boat, you considered bringing it to California it sounds like you when you make a financial analysis comparing uh mm -hmm. costs and whatnot with mexico well, versus South, southern california it sounds like you are considering that as an option well no the the consideration on the the thing down is just to figure out because once i took it down i i had looked at the numbers that the reason for the financial analysis was because that's why i decided to go to mexico which is where i wanted to go anyway um, because it's far, far cheaper. Plus, I, I intended to sail um, the Sea of Cortez and San Jose for a couple of years on vacations, you know, go down every three months or so. So, um, but I, you know, I, I'm probably mixing up some things because when I looked at 
getting a boat initially before I got the Newport 41 in Newport, I had done a lot of these same numbers. And I realized that I could not keep a boat in Southern California, particularly Newport Harbor, unless I had a mooring. But so I had a mooring and I had a very inexpensive boat on it, but I didn't have any other options. So there's a lot of just quick analysis done, nothing very formal, but. It's just one. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Uh, that's all the questions I had at this time. Uh, Judge Aldrich, uh, or yes, Judge Aldrich, you had a question? Hi, this is Judge Aldrich. Uh, Mr. Poole, so <clears throat> my understanding is that at each of those stops, uh, certain repairs were made uh, in not, California? Not necessarily. The stops were um, either because I had limited crew or no crew, and it wasn't safe for me to continue on. So. A lot of times it was just to stop. I would rent a car, head back to um, my home in Aliso Viejo and work for the week or the two until I could get back up there and sail down. Most of those, okay. um, yeah, there were some repairs made in Monterey, but they were really just minor, you know, making sure it's, it's normal maintenance for offshore sailing, like check batteries, check bilge pumps, check emergency systems. You know, I, I wouldn't, once I got out of Bottega, you know, there were repairs or like sort of refits, but it's just typical prudent yacht uh, maintenance. Okay. So repairs in Bodega and repairs in Monterey? Uh, yeah. But okay. Monterey was just sort of like fine tuning, you know, tighten down the batteries, um, refill with water, um, and check your lines in the rigging again. It's. It's it's normal maintenance on a sailing vessel if you're um, sailing offshore. Okay, um, and the maintenance or repairs those were all done by you and not some other like third party like a licensed repairman. No, they were all done by me, and 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 um, that's because at the time I held a U.S. Coast Guard Master of Vessel, which is commonly known as a Coast Guard um, Captain's License. It's a federally issued license, and I was working commercially for uh, the Sundiver Yachts um, Charter out of Long Beach as a dive boat captain on, you know, some trips even up to seven nights offshore. So as a U.S. Coast Guard master, um, I, I'm required to know every aspect about a vessel, including its repair, so I can either do the repair myself or hire someone who's appropriate to do so. In this case, I felt I was far better to make these repairs on my own vessel, besides the fact that it was a lot less expensive, but by doing it myself, I knew it was done correctly. Um, when I replaced the chain plates, that was close to a $20,000 estimate to have those done up in Portland. I did them myself, along with another um, boat craftsman up in Portland, and I'm I've, most of my undergrads in mechanical engineering, I've worked for 10 for a decade as a commercial captain. I'm very familiar with boat repair and better Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Um, that concludes my questions. Um, back to Judge Wong. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Poole, and thank you, Mr. Meza. Um, you'll have time at the end uh, for a closing statement rebuttal. Uh, but now we're going to turn to CDTFA for their presentation. Uh, you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as you are aware, we are here today to determine whether appellant is liable for use tax with respect to his purchase of a 1980 36.7 foot Tayana yacht named the Dublin Dragon. When a vessel is purchased from a person not required to hold a seller's permit for the sale of vessels, the applicable tax, if any, is use tax. That's Revenue and Tax Code Section 6283. We'll hear it after refer to that as the code, and we're looking at Subdivision A. Also, California Code of Regulations, Title 18, here and after referred to as Regulation, Section 16110, Subdivision B1C. Use tax applies to the storage, use, or other consumption in the state of tangible personal property purchased for use and used in California, measured by the sales price of the property. And that's code section 6201 and regulation section 1620, subdivision B1. 
the taxes owed by the person using, storing, or otherwise consuming the property in California. And again, that's code section 6206, subdivision A. So under regulation 1620, B5A, when a vessel is purchased outside of California, is first functionally used outside of California, and is brought into California within 12 months from the date of its purchase, it is rebuttably presumed that the, that the vessel was acquired for storage, use, or other consumption in the state and is subject to use tax if the vessel is purchased by a California resident. You can also see code section 6246. Under regulation 1620 B5B, this presumption may be rebutted by documentary evidence that the vessel was purchased for use outside the state. Moreover, under subsection D, a vessel that's brought into this state exclusively for the purpose of repair, retrofit, or modification shall not be deemed to be acquired for storage use or other consumption in the state if the repair, retrofit, or modification is, in the case of a vessel, performed by a repair facility that holds an appropriate permit issued by the board and is licensed to do business by the city and or county in which it is located if that city and or county so requires. So here, the following facts are not in dispute. Appellant is a California resident, and he did purchase the vessel in Oregon on January 14th, 2014 for the purchase price of $65,000. As appellant testified, he purchased the vessel solely for personal, i.e. non-commercial use, and he first functionally used the vessel outside of California and then brought the vessel into California on October 8th, 2014, which is within 12 months from the date of the purchase. So because appellant is a California resident, he is presumed to have purchased the vessel for use within the state. Thus, under regulation 1620, appellant has the burden of rebutting this presumption by providing documentary evidence showing that the vessel was purchased for use outside of the state during the first 12 months of ownership. Appellant has failed to provide this evidence. Appellant has provided registration of the vessel in Oregon, but he has stated that he did not intend to keep the vessel in Oregon. Thus, this evidence does not rebut the presumption. In fact, the evidence indicates that petitioner intended to moor the vessel at his slip in Newport Beach when it became possible for him to do so. And appellant has admitted that the unavailability of his slip in Newport Beach at the time he purchased the vessel, along with the relative inexpensiveness of registering the vessel in Oregon, is why the vessel remained in Oregon while undergoing its initial repairs and maintenance in preparation for his Mexico voyage. So based on the foregoing, appellant has failed to meet his burden of producing documentary evidence to rebut the presumption that he purchased the vessel for use in the state. Appellant has also failed to meet the repair, retrofit, or modification of vessels exception under regulation 1620 B5D. As provided, a vessel can be brought into the state and not deemed as used if it is brought into the state for purposes of being repaired by a permitted and licensed repair facility. Appellant brought the vessel into California numerous times during his voyage to Mexico, asserting that repairs needed to be made. In fact, between October 8th, 2014 and January 1st, 2015, the vessel was docked in Bodega Bay, Monterey, Morro Bay, Santa Barbara, and San Pedro, California. Based on the decision dates that were provided, the vessel was docked at Bottega Bay from October 8, 2014 through November 18, 2014, then docked in Monterey Bay from November 19th to the 29th, then um, sailed to Morro Bay, where it was docked from December 7th through 13th, 2014, Afterwards, the vessel was docked at Santa Barbara from December 13th to 20th and was finally docked in San Pedro from December 21st, 2014 until January 1st, 2015, when appellant departed for Mexico. Based on appellant's allegations, the vessel was docked in California for approximately three months due to repairs and also his need to rest. However, appellant has failed to provide any receipts or invoices for repairs made at a licensed repair facility during this time. 
Appellant alleges that he purchased supplies and made all the necessary repairs himself, but these self-made repairs do not suffice to meet the requirements under subsection D. Moreover, there is evidence that the vessel's presence within the state was not exclusively due to repairs that were needed to be made. For example, appellant testified today that he needed to dock in order to rest, which we completely understand, um, and also that it was docked in Monterey Bay and Morro Bay while he returned to home um, to work throughout uh, his voyage. So based on the foregoing, appellant has failed to provide any evidence to rebut the presumption that as a California resident, he purchased the vessel for use in California. Appellant's entire case rests on his allegations that he did not have an intention to bring it into the state, but his allegations without documentary evidence do not suffice to usher him within an exemption to California's sales and use tax laws. Additionally, appellant consistently used the vessel within the state of California within the 12 months of its purchase. So although we are very sympathetic to the to appellant's circumstances and the storm he faced, he has failed to meet his burden and his appeal should be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. This is Judge Wong. Uh, as CDTFA was providing argument and not witness testimony, they are not subject to cross-examination. So I'll now just turn to my uh, panel to see if they have any questions um, regarding CDTFA's presentation, starting with Judge Lee. Mr. Chesley, no questions. Thank you. Ms. Judge Wong, thank you. Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions for CDTFA? This is Judge Aldrich, uh, no questions, thank you. This is Judge Wong. Um, I also did not have any questions for CDTFA. So I will now turn it back over to Mr. Mesa um, for your rebuttal and closing, any closing remarks, closing presentation. Um, you have, let's see. I think you budgeted five minutes, but um, it take a little bit longer than that since um, I don't think you used all your time at the beginning. Mr. Meza. Yes, Your Honor. The CTFA states that Mr. Poole provided no documentary evidence and has failed to meet his burden of proving uh, his case that he's exempt from usage tax in California. Uh, the CFA states that he uses the, 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 the boat in California by docking it uh, for three months at the end of the year of 2014. But what they felt to see is that it was a necessity. Yes, it is to rest, to be prudent, to uh, to make it safe, not just for Mr. Poole, but for others. Forcing him out of the state and, and, and saying he has to solo shot at that point by himself would be unreasonable and infallible. Uh, yes, Mr. Poole did the repairs himself. Mr. Poole's a licensed individual with a lot of expertise in this. I mean, one could argue that, I mean, sure, there may be other uh, technicians out there that could match his work or, or, or be better at him, but someone with his area of expertise, because not just for a hobby for him, it's also his job at that time as well. He has very extensive knowledge of how to repair a boat, forcing him to pay out of pocket more money for a service he can perform himself is, I mean, this instance, it just seems very unfair to force an individual to do so. I mean, this is an individual with the knowledge and the know-how, not just because he watched some YouTube video or because he's an aficionado that does it on his free time. No, this is an individual who's licensed, who's licensed by <laughs> by proper uh, uh, governing agencies to do what he does. He not only does this for a hobby, he does this for a living. He knows how, he needs to know how to do these things because He's in charge of the lives when he's captaining in other boats, not just his personal vessel. Uh, when he purchased the, the Dublin Dragon, it was never his intent to have it in California outright. That's it. It, it, it. Sure, there was considerations, maybe potentially, but from his from his previous knowledge of what he knew about how much it would cost him more in, Mex uh, in Mexico versus California, the scarcity in California. That all influences the decision at the beginning to keep it out of California. Maybe in the future after 12 months, possibly, but at that point in time in 2014, when he purchased that vessel, there's no way there's it was it was just not possible for him to do so. Did he have a month to month contract? Yes. He stated earlier that he had a month to month contract in Oregon just for the possibility that he would miss that window 
of October 1st. Because after that, it would just would have been completely unreasonable for him to try to sell out in, 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 mid, in, in the plain winter where weather conditions are far worse. So Mr. Poole did everything possible to get at Oregon to go to Mexico, not to California. But he also kept that plan B to stay in Oregon, but not in California. He said earlier that he would he would potentially had done the month to month contract just because he had the, the possibility that he would be forced to keep it in Oregon and not sell it on during the winter. But he really wanted to go to Mexico. He wanted to sell it in Mexico, the Sea of Cortez. He had other future plans with the near future of selling that boat down in Mexico and the neighboring shores, the waters, the seas on there. That was his intention. It was not his intention to sell in California and keep it in California. It was his intention to sell it around Mexico. The possibility of him not being in Mexico, his plan B, his callback was Oregon. I have no further statements, Your Honor. Thank you. This Judge Wong, thank you. Um, I'll now turn to my panel for any final questions that they might have uh, for CDTFA uh, or appellant, uh, beginning with Judge Lee. No additional questions. This is Judge Lee. Thank you so much, everybody. This is Judge Wong. Judge Aldrich, did you have any final questions? This is Judge Aldrich. No final questions for me. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Um, I did have one final question um, for Mr. Poole. Did you, at this time, did you work for, what was your job? Did you work for like a boat repair facility or? Uh, no, I worked for Sundiver um, Charters out of Long Beach. It's um, owned by a guy named uh, uh, um, Ray, um, Ray, um, Ray Earl. He owns three boats up by well, yet. He's got more than that, but there are three of them that are used for dive boat charters for both overnight charters to Catalina and the Channel Islands and for day charters out of Long Beach to Catalina Island. So he's a licensed business. He's been operating for 20 some years and I would in an official cat capacity as um, captain of the vessel as master of the vessel. I would uh, he would I was hired um, sometimes on both Saturday and Sunday. But usually um, two to four times a month as a dive boat captain for um, scuba diving charters to the islands. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Uh, I didn't have any further questions. Uh, thank you for your uh, testimony uh, today. Uh, thank you to Appellant and CDKFA for your presentations. Um, if there are no final questions, this will uh, conclude the hearing. The record is closed and the case is submitted today. Uh, the judges will meet and decide the case based on the uh, exhibits presented and admitted as evidence, as well as uh, Mr. Poole's testimony. We will send both parties our written decision no later than 100 days from today. Uh, this oral hearing is now adjourned. Um, it will go off the record. Thank you. Then uh, OTA will reconvene at 1 p.m. for the next oral hearing today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.